We're continuing our series that we started. I'm entitling it a series opposed to a study at this point, um, called Understanding the Anointing. One of the things that um, any of you who are familiar with me have come to know is my heart is that I want us to understand the word. Meaning there are so many people who love God and I know they love God, but they hear things and they're just kind of like going through life and they're not gleaning all that God has for them. And a lot of the reason is because there are just some things that, you know, they don't hear about, we don't talk about, we don't discuss, and they just have a lack of understanding on it. And to me, one of the things that the Holy Spirit led me to do was for us to discuss the anointing, because there's a lot, we hear that word, we hear it used, and we really don't know the depth of all that it contains. So that's why we are uh, moving forward with this. Now, last time we talked about all kinds of things, and I'm not even gonna go into it. The last two sessions covered a lot of information, a lot of material. We have made available to you all types of ways for you to glean this information via CD, podcast, Periscope, everything. I ask that you please, if you missed one of the, the first two lessons, to please go back, not for me, but for you, for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. But I have to kind of start a little bit close to where we left off so that we can move forward. So with that being said, I'm going to ask that you turn with me in your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, the fourth chapter. Luke's Gospel, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start with verse 14. We talked about um, the fact that when you study all throughout the New Testament, that you will see how the anointing was on the ministry of Jesus. We talked about how Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, did not teach or preach anywhere until he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if we look at Luke chapter four, starting with verse 14, and I'm gonna share it with you today out of the Amplified. It says, then Jesus went back to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread through the entire region. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised and glorified and honored by all. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, the Messiah, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to announce release, pardon, forgiveness to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, downtrodden, bruised, crushed by tragedy, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the favor of God abound greatly. Now, do me a favor and drop down to verse 21 since you're already in that chapter. And I'm gonna read it to you first out of the expanded. Now, again, everybody who knows me, you know that I give you multiple translations. And again, the reason I do that isn't because I just wanna stand up here and read a lot of different translations. It's because I want you to get clarity. And I can explain it to you, but then you're hearing my word. I want you to see it in the word. So therefore, I give you multiple translations. So reading verse 20, we're going to read 20 and 21, actually, out of Luke's Gospel. And the expanded Bible, it says it this way. Jesus closed the book, or rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the assistant, the synagogue attendant, and sat down. Everyone, all the eyes in the synagogue, was watching Jesus closely. He began to say to them, while you heard these words just now, they were coming true. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. And in the Amplified, it says it this way. Then he rolled up the scroll, having stopped in the middle of the verse, gave it back to the attendant and sat down to teach. And the eyes of all those in the synagogue were attentively fixed on him. He began speaking to them. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and in your presence. Turn with me to Acts, um, the 10th chapter. 
because this is where Peter's actually teaching to Cornelius in his household. But it talks about what just happened with Jesus. So this is Acts the 10th chapter and the 38th verse. And let me know if you have it by saying you have it. Okay, great. So I'm going to read this to you first out of the expanded. And it says, you know about Jesus from Nazareth that God gave him, anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. You know how Jesus went everywhere doing good and healing those who were ruled, oppressed by the devil because God was with him. If we look at it in the Living Bible, it says it this way. And you no doubt know that Jesus of Nazareth was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were possessed by demons for God was with him. Now, most often people think about or discuss the ministry, when they're discussing the ministry of Jesus, they automatically think that he did the wonderful great works that he did because he was the son of God. Now it is true, and we talked about this or touched on it a little bit last time. It is true that he, it never changed that he was the son of God. However, he did not minister on earth in that capacity. And it's very important for us as believers to understand that. He ministered as a mere man, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now here's why that's important for you to see. And I really want you to catch this. Okay, everybody pretty much, if I were to tell you to give me an example of Queen Elizabeth's life, okay, as we know it. We see her across the pond in all of her reign as queen. Do you ever think that Queen Elizabeth has to be concerned with bills? Or do you think she's going around vacuuming the, the, <laughs> the castle that she lives in or uh, fixing meals? She has people to do all this, right? So you see her in her royal status. You see her receiving, or you can imagine her, receiving an audience in the throne room where she's sitting in all of her majesty to talk to the people who are coming along, you know, to have whatever it is that they have to say. You can see her in her royalty, correct? Now, suppose she decides, okay, I'm gonna give all of that up and I'm gonna come and I'm gonna live in a shelter in New York City. Or better yet, I'm gonna live on the streets of New York City, and then I'm gonna try to get into the shelter so that I can just kind of bathe and freshen up. But I'm gonna give up all of this to come and live on the street. That's a big thing, wouldn't you say? Well, guess what? That's what Jesus did. Now, if Queen Elizabeth did it, she would still be Queen Elizabeth, but she would just be living on the streets of New York. You know, just like homeless people that you see. Well, Jesus left all that he had to come here and live as a man. So therefore, the, he needed to be anointed to do the acts of being the son of God because he left all of that deity when he left the throne room of God to come here and just walk the streets. That's why, think about it, people had just seen him as Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary. They didn't see anything so special about him. He didn't do anything. He never did anything great until he was what? Anointed by God. Now, this is the part that is real exciting to me when you think about it. Every single one of you who is sitting here before you were born again, you were just whoever your parents told you you were. <laughs> and that's wonderful. But the day you accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, there is an anointing on your life. Therefore, you are no longer the same little girl or same little boy that your parents told you were with the same little capabilities that they said you had. You are an anointed. There is nothing, no thing in this world that you have to have any kind of care or concern or feel in any way, shape or form that you cannot overcome. We sing it, but I don't know if we get it. 
Yeah, we are victorious. Yes, we are overcomers. But why is that? Because we are anointed. And we have the same anointing in us that Jesus has. You need to get that. You know, that's one of those things that you might have to get up in the morning and look in the mirror and tell yourself. Write it on a post-it note and stick it there to remind yourself that you are anointed. There is nothing that can be presented to you throughout the whole entire day that you will not overcome once you know that. I just find it exciting. I don't know about you all, but I think that that is great. So, it is true that he never changed, he was still the son of God. And we already read how in verse 21 of Luke 24 that the scripture was being fulfilled from what Isaiah the prophet had already said about him. So think about it. Jesus had been ministering as the son of God. If he was doing just that, he wouldn't have needed to be anointed because he's the son of God if he was operating in that same way because we already know that God doesn't need to be anointed. Turn with me, because who would anoint him? I mean, who would anoint the Most High God? Turn with me to Philippians 2, and we're gonna read verse seven. Philippians 2, verse seven. And I'm gonna read it out of the expanded first, and it says, but he, meaning Jesus, gave up his place with God and made himself nothing, emptied himself. He became like, took the form of, a servant, a slave, bond servant, and was born as a man in the likeness of humanity or men. If we look at it in the Amplified, it says, he emptied himself without renouncing or diminishing his deity. See, he didn't do that. He didn't diminish or renounce it, but he did empty himself. But only temporarily giving up the outward expression of divine equality and his rightful dignity by assuming the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He became completely human, but was without sin, being fully God and fully man. Jesus was always the son of God, yet until he was anointed after being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, we all remember that, he never healed a person or even worked a miracle. Turn with me to Luke's gospel, and this is exactly where we left off last time. Luke's Gospel, the third chapter, and the 22nd verse. And it specifically says, I'm gonna read it out of the expanded. And for those of you who do not have the expanded Bible, the expanded translation breaks down every single word and gives you exactly what it means. It's very, very, very literal. And we have them for sale in the bookstore if you do not have one. Um, so Luke 3, 22 in the expanded says, and the Holy Spirit came down on him in the form of bodily appearance like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love, dearly beloved son, and I am very pleased with you in whom I take great delight. And I'm not gonna read it, but Matthew 3, 17 pretty much gives another account of exactly the same thing. And as I mentioned to you before, um, Matthew 3.17 is really the first instance that we have recorded in the gospel where God the Father is actually speaking audibly to Jesus, his son. So even though it does seem a little different for us to kind of understand, I'm sure that you can get it, especially with that analogy of the queen. I mean, it, it should be easy, and you guys are smart. I know that you'll get it. So Jesus, in his status as the son of God, there is no comparison. He is incomparable to anything or anyone that we know. But Jesus in his ministry as a mere man isn't. If he were, and this is key, then the word would be untrue. And we already know the word is true. So let me show you exactly what I mean. Turn with me to John's gospel, and we're going to look at chapter 14. And let me know when you're there because I want you to see this. John 14, and we're gonna look at verses 12 and 13, and I'm going to read it for you first out of the expanded. So do you have it? Okay. So starting with verse 12, it says, I tell you the truth, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the same things that I do. And this is talking about Jesus. This is what Jesus is saying. Those who believe will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. 
They will do greater things because all believers, not just Jesus, will have the Holy Spirit living in them and empowering them. And if you ask for anything in my name, asking in my name means acknowledging that Jesus is the mediator between God and human beings. The name represents the person. I will do it for you so that the Father's glory will be shown. The Father might be glorified through or in the Son. Now, another way of putting it is the way that the Amplified says it, which says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, anyone who believes in me as Savior will also do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than these in extent and outreach because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name as my representative. This I will do so that the Father may be glorified and celebrated in the Son. Now with the Amplified, what both versions actually did was put in what I call qualify qualifiers. As you know, it said, anyone who believes in me as Savior. So in other words, these verses of scripture, really the whole Bible is written to believers. So somebody who is in the world, it's not going to work for them. This is only going to work for people who are in the kingdom, who are believers. You have to believe in him as Savior to be able to do the works, because first of all, if you don't believe in him as Savior, you would never be anointed. Okay. So the scripture clearly states that whoever does believe in Jesus will do even greater things than he did. Well, how is that? Because the same Holy Spirit lives in us and empowers us. In other words, once again, we are anointed just as Jesus was. So if you were writing notes and you wanted to define the word anointing, a good definition of it would be this. The burden removing yoke destroying power of the Most High God. I'll repeat that just in case you're writing it. The definition for anointing would be the burden removing yoke, destroying power. Think about that. Burden removing yoke, destroying power of the Most High God. Jesus had this anointing all over him and demonstrated, demonstrated it throughout his ministry. After he was crucified and right before he ascended into heaven, he told his followers to wait in Jerusalem for a very specific reason. He told them to wait there until they received power after the Holy Spirit came upon them. So that right there lets us know that we need to do more than just be believers and accept him as savior. We need to be baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a second thing that we need to do. It's important that we do that. Turn with me to Acts, and we're gonna look at Acts chapter one. And first we're gonna read verses four and five. And let me know when you're there. This is Acts one. Okay, I know Elder Nate's there, anybody else? <laughs> okay, great. All right, so you guys, are you all asleep? Because you're so sweet and quiet, but I want you to kind of, you know, like talk back to me. It's all right. It's okay. All right. So now, Acts 1, we're going to look at verse 4. Out of the expanded, it says, Once when he was eating or staying, meeting with them, he told, commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. And he is talking about Jesus. He said, wait there to receive the promise from the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit, which I told you about. John baptized people with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, if we look at it in the Amplified, it says, while being together and eating with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, of which he said, you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized and empowered and united, that's a key word, with the Holy Spirit not long from now. So it's obvious that that's something that is important. But while you're in Acts, drop, drop right down. You're in the first chapter to verse 8. And this is a verse that we're all very, very familiar with. And it says in the expanded, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you will receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and in every part of the world to the ends of the earth. In the Living Bible, it says it this way, but when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power to testify about me with great effect, 
to the people in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth about my death and resurrection. In order for us to be effective as disciples in our walk, sharing the word with others, we need this precious gift of the Holy Spirit because that is our power source. And it gives us the ability to be able to minister. Now think about this, because I always want you to think about what we're talking about. So if Jesus needed to be anointed with the Holy Spirit while he was on the earth, what in the world makes you think you don't? Are you better than Jesus? Of course you're not. So every single believer needs to be able to be baptized. You are able to do it, you just need to receive it. It is a gift. You need to be filled to overflowing with that precious gift. And you know it's evident in your life because you get your own special prayer language, which you speak with other tongues, but you need that anointing. Let me tell you, it's not really just for you. It is for you to be able to touch others, to minister to others. When you're sinning and you're wondering how come certain things aren't maybe manifesting in your life the way that they should be manifesting. When you want to know how come certain people in your household, in your family, that you love dearly, who you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt are going to be spending eternity with the Most High God and eternity with you. If you want to be able to do that and minister to them effectively, you must have this gift. Don't think that just being born of the Spirit of God is enough. It isn't. If it wasn't enough for Jesus, who was the Son of God, what in the world makes you think it's enough for you? I don't understand that. I just don't. But you know what? We all have choices to make. So if you just want to mutter on through, that's up to you. <laughs> okay? But I want God's best. That is my desire. I want all that he, he created me for a reason. I am not a mistake. Okay. I am here for a purpose. It's something I was, I don't know. It was a couple of weeks ago because I think I shared it on a Thursday night, but it blessed me. So I was talking to the Lord in the morning, which that's not unusual, but one of the things that he shared with me is that the world may have rejected me, but he accepted me. But the other thing was that he didn't just accept me, he adopted me. Not that though, it goes beyond that. Not only did he adopt me, he loves me. And he loves me in a way that is beyond human comprehension. There are no conditions on the love that he has for me. And when you realize that and you walk in that, you can put your shoulders back, you can put on your priestly garments, and you can walk knowing that I am one of the anointed. And there is nothing at all that you can be faced with that you don't know, that you know that you know that you win. And for me, that's important. <laughs> I like that. So therefore, it's just the way I look at it. And I, I keep trying to come up with ways to share it because I want everybody to feel that way. I want everybody to have that. That's my heart. Turn with me to Galatians, the third chapter. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 14, because this is something else that I want you to see. Galatians 3. We're going to look at verses 6 through 14, and I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified. Let me know when you're there. Okay, so starting with verse 6, it says this. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, as conformity to God's will and purpose, so it is with you also. Now, I'm going to pause there. It is with you also if you are going about God's will and purpose, okay? Again, it's another qualifier. Picking up in verse seven. So understand that it is the people who live by faith with confidence in the power and goodness of God who are the true sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaimed the good news of the Savior to Abraham in advance with this promise saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are people of faith, whether Jew or Gentile, are blessed and favored by God. 
and declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty and placed in right standing with him, along with Abraham, the believer. For all who depend on the law, seeking justification and salvation by obedience to the law and the observance of rituals, are under a curse. For it is written, cursed, condemned to destruction, is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, so as to practice them. Now it is clear that no one is justified, that is, declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty and placed in right standing before God by the law. For the righteous, the just, the upright shall live by faith. But the law does not rest on or require faith. It has nothing to do with faith. But instead the law says, he who practices them, the things prescribed by the law shall live by them instead of faith. Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs crucified on a tree or cross. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might also come to the Gentiles so that we would all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. That is very powerful. You might need to go home and read it again, okay? And if you don't have the Amplified, get a hold of the Amplified, read it and meditate on it. One of the reasons that Jesus was so popular during the time that he walked the earth was because of what he taught. There was a huge contrast between the Pharisees, the scribes, and the teachers of the time who taught the law and the curse of the law. Jesus, on the other hand, taught the blessing of Abraham. He taught the promise of Abraham and the anointing of the power of God on the blessing, not the curse. Now think about it. If you were living, you don't even have to just be living during that time, living now. Wouldn't you want to hear about the blessing opposed to the curse of the law? Wouldn't you want to live your life, okay, with the blessing and not with the curse? Everything that Jesus dealt with, dealt with the anointing. Let's look at, you're already in Galatians 3, so let's just drop down to verses 26 through 29. And I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified first. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Starting with verse 26, it says, For you who are born again have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and are all children of God, set apart for his purpose with full rights and privileges through faith in Christ Jesus. Now I have to pause there. Notice that it says through faith in Christ Jesus. There will be many believers who have this ability to have all of the rights and privileges. You are set apart, but if you don't see that, if you don't grasp that, you can still live a broke, busted, disgust, disgusted, just totally unfruitful life. That's your choice because you have to believe and you have to receive these things, how? By faith, because you hear me say it all the time, faith is what? The currency of the kingdom. So pick it up in verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, into a spiritual union with Christ the anointed, have clothed yourselves with Christ. That is, you have taken on his characteristics and values. There is now no distinction in regard to salvation, neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you who believe are all one in Christ Jesus. No one can claim a spiritual superiority. So therefore, I don't give a care what your title is, what position you think you're a hold, you hold, you know, you're the head of the door openers, whatever it is you think you do, that's sweet. We just give you a title so to make you feel good, okay? And so that we can locate you. But it does not make you superior to anyone else, okay? We are all one, okay, in Christ. That's important, because I, you know, well, for those of you who clapped, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, verse 29. And if you belong to Christ, if you are in him, 
then you are Abraham's descendants and spiritual heirs according to God's promise. Now the Living Bible makes it real short and sweet and it says, for now we are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, through Jesus Christ rather. And we who have been baptized into, in union with Christ are enveloped by him. Oh, I like that. We are no longer Jews or Gentiles or slaves of free men or even merely men or women, but we are all the same. We are Christians. We are one in Christ Jesus. And now that we are Christ's, we are the true descendants of Abraham and all of God's promises to him belong to us. And I think that is just marvelous. I mean, I absolutely love it. Huh. So here's the other thing. If you are in Christ, there is an anointing for everything you are called to do, no matter how great or how small the task. And the key here is, if you're called to do it. You see, I'll put it to you this way. We all usually wear shoes. <laughs> There's like a left foot and a right foot, you know? I mean, all things being equal. If you put the shoe designed for the left foot on your right foot, I mean, you can do it, but it doesn't feel right. It just doesn't, you don't flow well with it. You could walk around that way, but you're just not comfortable. You just know something's off, correct? Whereas if you get a pair of shoes and you put them on and they fit correctly and, and you put them on the right feet, you can go about your business and do what you need to do. Well, oftentimes, even believers will put themselves in positions that God didn't call them to. And that it's like wearing shoes on the wrong feet. And you're just going about doing what you're doing, but you're not flowing. You just, you know, it's like the anointing is short-circuiting. You know, it, it's sort of like you take um, a straw and you pinch it. So the, the fluid is not flowing through when you, you know, when you're trying to get the drink out through the straw, it's just not working. There's a crank there. You're not flowing if you're not doing what he's called you to do. We have to get about doing our father's business and stop trying to do our own. It's not about us. We were created for his pleasure to do what it is he called us to do. And when we do that and we are anointed to do it, oh my goodness, is it just a wonderful thing. And then you'll see how that anointing gets stronger and he'll take you from one spot to the next spot. I mean, it goes back to, you heard me tell the story five million times, and I know it may seem crazy, but somebody on Periscope may not have heard it. When I used to work in the counseling room and I was trying to figure out what could I do, I didn't even know at the time I had any anointing because I, I didn't learn that yet, okay? But I knew that I loved God and I wanted to do something. So I took it upon myself because we would go with the apostle and have crusades all across the country. And we would go into a meeting place, there would be an altar call, and literally hundreds of people would come forward. So we would have to be prepared ahead of time. So say it was a room like this, we would put packets on each chair. But sometimes, if they didn't have people to do that, it would have to be done when the, con you know, when the people were coming in. And I kept saying, Lord, I first of all, I asked. Always ask for wisdom, we went over that before. I asked, Lord, what can I do to be helpful? And he showed me, you can go there early and you can put packets on the chairs. I was like, okay, I can do that. Let me tell you something. I became anointed for that task because not only did I put packets on the chairs, I made sure that the packets, you would have thought the Marines came and put the packets on the chair. They were all straight in the same direction. I went inside the packets. I took scratch paper, made sure every single pen worked so that when the people came, they didn't have to wonder because they were brand new pens. And you know, sometimes you have to scratch. I did all that. I made sure it was the best that it could be. Then I prayed over every single seat. I was anointed to do that because I asked in my heart was connected to wanting to serve him. And I was able to do something that needed to be done. I made myself available. I would have never thought that from doing that simple task that I was anointed to do, that it would take me from doing that 
to being able to lead anybody to Christ, no less to be able to teach people how to do that, no less to be able to teach anything, no less to be able to stand before you today. It is real if you just apply it. And like we talked about last time, open yourself up. Be an open vessel to receive all that God has for you because there is an anointing on your life. You are a very, very valued part of the body of Christ, but you've got to believe that and receive it by faith. <sighs> Turn with me to Philippians, the fourth chapter. And this is a verse of scripture you've heard. You probably can quote it by heart, but we're going to look at it a little bit different. Um, yeah, this is the apostle Paul who's reminding of this, of this verse of scripture. He wrote it and he's reminding us of the fact that no matter what it is you're called to do, you're anointed to do it. Philippians 4.13 in the New King James Version, this is the one everybody knows, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We all know it, we got it, that's great. The Living Bible says, for I can do everything God asked me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and power. See, I like that a little bit better because it's explaining a little bit more how Christ is gonna give me the strength and power to do what God has asked me to do. But the Amplified breaks it down the best and it says it this way. I can do all things which he, meaning God, has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. In other words, I can do all things through Christ the anointed and his anointing which strengthens me. That's a big difference than just walking around talking about I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and you don't understand what you're actually saying. If he has called you to do it, you can do it. I don't give a care what it is. You can do it. You just have to believe him and receive it by faith. Now, I'm try I always try to break things down to a level where we are right now to try to be able to get it. I don't give a care what storm you might be looking at or growing through at the moment. You may have received a terminal report from the doctor. Now, let me explain something to you. <laughs> I always think, we say this and you hear many people stand up and say, you know, you've received something terminal from the doctor. Until you have, you don't get the gravity of what that means. Until a doctor sits up and tells you that you really might not be here, all of a sudden, it has a whole different feel. Now, we can try to learn experientially from people, and we can try to, you know, sympathize, but I'm here to tell you it makes a difference. And I don't always talk about this, but I don't know why. <laughs> For you, I just love you, so I tell you all everything. I can talk about me, so I do. I will never forget, in 2006, I was standing, well, I was actually inside lens crafters with my 15-year-old daughter who was getting fitted for contact lenses. It was like a birthday gift for her. She wanted contacts. Yeah, okay, fine. I receive a call from my doctor, and I had to go outside to get the call, you know, because I didn't want to sit there and talk and ruin the, the whole exam. So I go outside, and I get a report that shook me to my very core. And I remember saying clearly to the doctor, I am not ready to die. Because you see, we don't, again, <laughs> we talk and we are very superficial sometimes in our thoughts. But when the really, when it gets to you and it's like they're telling you you're going to check out, all of a sudden it's a whole different picture, okay? And I remember saying to her, I am not ready to die. And I meant that with every fiber of my being. I had a 15 year old sitting inside. I was like, I have things to, to share with her. I can't clock out now. I got four other kids at home. I have a husband, what do you mean? No, 
I had to make a decision. And I decided that the word was anointed. <laughs> and therefore, that meant it affected me. And I was like, I, I, and I did not share. As a matter of fact, I was head counselor at the time. And I remembered that I was going to have to have a major surgery. And they had to set up all kinds of things for that surgery because, again, they, their report was that they didn't expect me to be here much longer. But I did not share. Stan and I have been married for 43 years. I didn't even tell him the gravity of what was said to me because I was to a point where it's me and Jesus. Okay, nobody stretched their arms and died for me but him, so he's gonna pull me out of this. I just gave him enough information and that's all he needed. Didn't tell my children for months, okay? And then I didn't tell them the whole story because it was between me and Jesus. But you see, when you believe the word with every fiber of your being, and it's not something you come into church playing with and you think it's a cute thing to do, he will meet you where you are because he is the anointed one. And he is within you. Guess what? Where am I? I am here and I am living strong to declare the works of the Most High God. And for all of those reports, the Anointed One took care of it for me. So he will do the same thing for you. Because even though I would love to think I am his favorite, I know that's not true. He is no respecter of persons. So again, I don't care what any doctor tells you. You listen to them to get knowledge, to get information, they're there to help you. But the anointed one paid the price. He paid the price. So therefore, if you want to receive your healing, believe. Do what you're told because doctors are here for a reason. I'm not anti-doctor, okay? I'm not telling you not to listen to the doctors but don't buy into, they did not create you, okay? And here's how you must always remember. I don't care whatever storm you're going through right now, before you were ever born, God knew that day was going to come. So if he knew that day was going to come, then you can rest in him because nobody can take care of you better than he can. And you need to just rest in that. Just trust him. But you see, that's really being very authentic. It's not telling you something that's cute. It's not a little Hallmark card that you can read and think is fine. It's real. But all I can tell you is, <laughs> Jesus, the anointed one. We tell you all the time the Godhead is within you. So if Jesus is within me, I don't have an expiration date. So I'm not going to allow them to tell me that I do. I mean, you might be in a situation where you don't have money in your hands by sight. And you just honestly do not see how you are going to pay whatever it is that you've got to pay. Don't let it, don't sit up and lose sleep over it. Don't walk the floors being concerned with it. Because guess what? And when you think about it, this, you don't even have to use faith, this logic. That's not going to bring the money and put it in your hands if you walk in the floor and sleep. You might as well get some rest. Okay? Because it's not going to change it. But you have to trust God. And you have to know, yet again, he knew. Just like one of the things, and I've shared this before, I love Jesse Duplantis, who, you know, he would get those massive tele, you know, television bills for millions and millions of dollars. You know, we sit and think we have a lot because, you know, we have a few thousand or something. And they're talking about millions. And he would just sit up and say, Jesus, you got mail. In other words, <laughs> deal with it, okay? But well, we have to have that kind of confidence in believing that he's going to take care of us. As long as we are being obedient, okay, to his word, to his will and doing what it is that he's called us to do. He is not going to ever, ever, ever leave us in the lurch. He doesn't work that way, okay? So we need to understand that. There are many people who have children 
And I think this is always so cute because, you know, <laughs> you could be 120 and your child could be 100. It's still your child. <laughs> okay, they don't tell you that when you bring the little bundles of joy home. You think, oh, when they're 18, <laughs> they don't just evaporate, okay? They're always your children. You're always going to be dealing with them. I don't care how old they get. Just again, understand and trust God. They may be looking like they're acting as if they have lost every thought in their head. Again, the anointed one is available to you. All you have to do is trust him and don't ever, ever, ever give up. Another thing that happens for people is you may be sitting and you have family members, and this goes out to me because so many people have family members who are not saved. And, you know, I mean, if you're a believer, come on, you want your family to be saved. They, and sometimes they can be really special because they don't want to hear the word. They can be belligerent, nasty, and if you're even talking the word, I mean, you know, I remember having one, <laughs> well, it's not even funny. It's interesting. Okay, I'll share this with you. I don't know why these things are coming. Another interesting story. My youngest daughter went through, we call it the Floyd years. That's what we call it because she was in high school and we had taken her out of public, uh, private school where she'd been all her life. And she was in public school for the first time for two years. And boy, those were some interesting years. So we call them the Floyd years. I really thought the child had lost every thought <laughs> because she was really not acting like she had been reared to act. And I remember taking her to a, to a restaurant, sitting down with her, and I'm telling you, I know with everything in me that if that child had a gun and could have killed me, she would have done it. She literally hated my guts, and I knew that. But the anointed one said, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart. So therefore, I sat there, and I was pleasant, and I smiled. She didn't want to look at me. She didn't want to have anything to do with me. But I kept smiling because I had to show her the love of Christ that resided in me. At one point, I had to even go to the ladies' room because it was painful, okay? Because I knew my child hated me. This was my baby. It hurt, okay? I went to the ladies' room, got in the stall, and cried like a baby, splashed some water on my face, and came back out smiling because I refused to give up. Well, God didn't give up either. She has a ministry. She built an app to reach other people. This is how much she loves the Lord. And we could not be any closer than ever. But it wasn't me. It was the anointed one in me who refused to give up on her. So don't give up on your family members. Understand that you love them, but God loves them more. And, oh, I have to quit. <laughs> I am so out of time. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching, and remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. 
we would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.